For almost half an hour, Eric had been watching from his car window as two small, thin, fragile figures wandered across the field, putting something into their mouths. Once upon a time, we used to walk here as kids, just like that, Eric said thoughtfully aloud, but we gathered not scraps, but berries, and also stuffed them into our mouths. Eric, can we leave already? I'm going to suffocate, said his personal driver, who was pinching his nose with a handkerchief. What, Marcus, don't you like how the homeland smells? Eric asked angrily. This is not my homeland. I was born in Mexico, replied the driver. I know it's not yours, Marcus, but to me, you're all the same, Eric continued thoughtfully. And I know you were born in Mexico, too, I read your personal file. But homeland, this is mine, you understand? This place used to have a village where I was born. And over there, he waved his hand, were fields. Here, where we're standing, there used to be an oak grove with fragrant, aromatic mushrooms. And over there, where the girls are wandering, there were strawberries, I can still remember their scent. So tell me, Marcus, don't you like how my homeland smells? I do, Eric, the driver mumbled into the handkerchief. Well, that's great. If you like it, then put your pristine kidney in your pocket and breathe deeply. Your boss was born here. Eric almost shouted. He opened the car doors and stepped outside. The stench was so strong that it stung his eyes, while the little girls continued to pick things up and eat. Eric's heart simply ached. Hey, girls, come here. Eric shouted, waving the children over. The girls looked in his direction and, seemingly reluctantly, walked toward him. One girl approached quite closely, while the other kept her distance, watching and simultaneously picking her nose. Mindy, don't go over there. What if something happens, said the one who was keeping her distance. Don't worry, what's he going to do, replied the bolder one. The girls were dirty, their hair matted into a solid clump, as if they had a felt boot on their heads. Their clothes were torn and also dirty. They were almost barefoot, except for the rags wrapped around their feet. They clearly did not know parental care. Maybe they're from nearby villages, Eric thought, but remembering his childhood, he understood they hadn't been like that. Yes, they ran around barefoot, got dirty, but their grandmother would never have let them into bed looking like that. First, a bath, and only then home. In the morning, she would give him and his brother clean clothes, and they would run around all day until evening. But these girls were clearly orphans. Where are your mom and dad? Eric asked. No mom, she died, shouted the girl who was keeping her distance. And we've never seen our dad, said the one who was closer. Eric realized her name was Mindy. He looked at their emaciated bodies and remembered himself and his brother. Their father had also died young. He was killed by poachers. Their mother had died of grief a year after him. But he and his brother didn't feel abandoned. They had their grandmother, who raised them and brought them up. His brother was a year older. He was the first to be called into the army. Unfortunately, he never returned from there. Their grandmother turned gray overnight as soon as she received the death notice. She clung to Eric and only whispered, I won't let you go. But they didn't take him. First, he was the only grandson left to his grandmother, and second, he was found to have scoliosis. They said that with a crooked back, he wasn't needed in the army. Girls, do you want something to eat? Eric asked. Of course. The girls replied in unison. At that moment, Eric noticed how similar they looked to each other. Well, hop into the car, he winked at Mindy, and call your sister. Aren't you going to trick us? Mindy asked. No, I definitely won't trick you. Mindy turned to her sister and called out. Sarah, come on, 
He'll feed us and take us for a ride in the car. Sarah was still afraid of something. I'm not that scary, Eric thought. Well, then I'll go alone, Mindy shouted and climbed into the car. She's always like this, scared of everything, the girl muttered. Well, we can't just leave your sister here, Eric said. We won't leave her. You'll feed me, buy her food, and bring it back here, the girl said cheerfully. There was logic in her words, but Eric didn't want the girls to linger in the dump. He wasn't that kind of person, he couldn't help halfway. If he took on something, he did it to the end, all the way to the finish. It was clear without any explanations, the girls needed help urgently, before something bad happened, before someone else picked them up. Eric, the meeting is in an hour, and we still have to return to the city, the driver reminded him. Oh, Marcus, you're here. Well, what, haven't you suffocated yet in my homeland? I almost forgot about you. Remind me, dear. Who's the boss here, me or, perhaps, you? Eric said reluctantly. The driver mumbled something under his breath. Well, thanks for that, my friend. So remember this, I'll decide for myself where and when to go, and what negotiations to conduct. Or even to not conduct them at all, Eric said, then turned away and cursed. They hire anyone based on ads. By the way, I have a higher education, the driver said. And don't eavesdrop, Eric replied sharply. Then you'll be the one saying I should have warned you, I should have dragged you away. And again, he'll be the one to blame, the driver said resentfully. Marcus. Eric barked again. I told you, to me, you're all the same, he thought. Eric noticed that as soon as Mindy got into the car, the second girl, apparently Sarah, immediately moved closer to the vehicle, but she was still afraid of something. Who's older, you or her? Eric asked Mindy, who was already sitting in the car. I don't know, the girl shrugged. What do you mean, don't know? Eric was surprised. Well, we're twins, Mom used to say. The girl replied. The second little girl came very close. Eric just had to reach out his hand. In a quick motion, he opened the door and grabbed the girl by the hand. She began to scream and squirm like a snake. Eric literally tossed her into the car. She pressed against her sister and immediately fell silent. Let's go, he commanded the driver. The meeting room was noisy. Many people had gathered, reporters and even competitors had arrived. Everyone wanted to witness the deal of the century. Eric entered with a slight delay, just a few minutes. Sorry, I had urgent matters to attend to. So, where do we start? What's on the agenda? Eric walked into the meeting room and immediately noticed how people grimaced and covered their noses. Don't you like the smell? He asked with a smirk. Someone in attendance tried to make a joke, saying something about friends of different tastes and colors. But suddenly, the secretary burst into the meeting room. Eric, I can't take it anymore. They have lice crawling right across their faces, she shouted in despair. Meanwhile, two girls burst into the meeting room and froze next to Eric. Look at this, he said, this is exactly the reason for my delay. I stopped by, you know, to my homeland. To the place, so to speak, of power. And the homeland is gone, they've turned it into a dump, and here on the dump are these orphans, in the 21st century. The girl spotted the papers on Eric's table and took them without asking. This is a contract, the secretary exclaimed. The girls began to read it aloud in unison, clearly, loudly, without a stutter and with expression. The faces of those gathered turned to astonishment. They're reading, they really are reading it, whispers arose from all around. Wait, are they reading it in Spanish? The attendees were even more surprised. 
The thing was that the copy of the contract lying in front of Eric was printed in Spanish. The English translation was supposed to be brought only at the end of the negotiations for signing. And the girls were reading in Spanish as if it were their native language. How was this possible? Even if we assume they studied at a school with an advanced language program, they wouldn't be able to read so fluently in just a couple of years, especially to understand it. But the girls clearly understood what they were reading. From time to time, they turned to Eric and glanced at the others, as if searching for someone with their eyes. But what surprised everyone the most was what happened at the very end. The girls read the contract to the last word and suddenly threw themselves around Eric's neck in tears. Not only Eric was stunned, but everyone present was as well. Eric couldn't imagine how his morning trip to his small homeland would end. He hadn't been there for almost ten years. The negotiations he planned to conduct today and the deal that was to follow were very important to Eric, not only from a financial perspective. The moral aspect of the event was also significant. The thing was, it was a kind of revenge. Eric's revenge against his former friend. His former best friend. That's why, on the advice of an acquaintance who practiced esotericism, he decided to visit the so-called place of power. Every person has such a place of power, it's where they were born. There, people draw energy from their lineage. It wasn't that Eric believed in all this. He was just sometimes curious, more out of boredom and for general development. The question about city people remained open, where should they go, maybe to the maternity ward. But Eric was from the countryside, and he had such a place of power. True, now where his native village once was, there was a landfill. But in his opinion, this shouldn't hinder reconnecting with the spirit of his lineage. The decision to go there was spontaneous, nervous tension before the deal was off the charts, and he decided to visit his native village, where it all began. Eric and Dean grew up together in the village. Eric's older brother, who died during his service in the army, also grew up with them. But a brother is a brother, and a friend is a bit different. Friendship is such a strange relationship that can't be described in words. And although Dean was just a friend, he became a true brother to Eric after the older brother's death. Dean was the same age as Eric. They went to school together and sat at the same desk. Sometimes Eric couldn't understand whom he loved more, his brother or his friend. After his brother's death, Dean took his place in Eric's heart. Then something happened that often occurs in life. They both fell in love with the same girl. Catherine was also from their village, a couple of years younger. At first, the guys didn't pay attention to her, but when she grew up and became beautiful, both of them opened their eyes. Catherine couldn't make a choice. She liked both Eric and Dean. She was torn between them, confusing herself and both of them. Then Dean made the choice for her, he left. Not just left but he dropped everything and went to Spain to try his luck. Dean's mother later said that he had a distant relative in Spain on his father's side. That was where Dean went. They said there it was possible to find work or even start a business. Catherine cried at first, regretting that he hadn't taken her with him, but over time she began to date Eric. Eric told Catherine several times that he didn't need her pity. But she always responded in confusion. What does pity have to do with it? I love you. Calm down already. You need to live, get married, not just make people laugh, Eric continued. What if we have kids? What will we do then? Catherine just laughed it off. What stamps in a passport? We have nothing to share. You have your own house with your grandmother. I have mine with my mother. We live wherever we want. Eric dreamed of building his own house without any moms or grandmas. He even inquired about how young families could get plots of land from the agency. But Catherine didn't take this seriously. 
What family? Where's the proof? They lived together for six years, and only on the fifth attempt did Catherine agree to marry him. They started preparing for the wedding, and one day Eric asked her why they hadn't had any children after all these years. Catherine just shrugged. Maybe it's worth getting checked? Eric suggested. If you need to, then you go get checked, she replied tersely. Eric didn't insist any further. He had lived his whole life with his grandmother, with whom he wouldn't discuss such matters. And he hadn't had a chance to talk with his brother about it. He died when they were still too young to think about having children. Dean also disappeared abroad. Eric, not understanding women's affairs, no longer asked Catherine. He was afraid she would get angry and refuse to marry him altogether. Preparations were in full swing. There was only a week left until the wedding. Somewhere, a suit had been bought and a dress had been brought from the district center. Suddenly, Dean's mother received a letter from him from Spain. Dean had become rich over these years, turning into an important don. The wealthy relative he went to see had died and left Dean his entire fortune. His mother read her son's letter to the whole village more than once. She was proud, she cried. Everyone, from the youngest to the oldest, knew that letter by heart. And Catherine was wondering, hadn't she jumped into marriage? Yet there wasn't a single word about him, about his friend, no questions, no greetings. Nothing. As if Dean had never had a friend like Eric in his life. A little. But at that time, Eric was not thinking about Dean. He was planning to get married. He would soon have a family. And so, amidst all the wedding preparations, Eric didn't notice that Catherine had become a different person after that letter. And then came the day of the wedding. They both didn't want to fuss about the bride price and other trendy embellishments. They simply agreed that Eric would wait for Catherine at the village council, and from there, after the registration, they would go together with the guests to the village club, where the tables would be set and everything else. Eric stood at the entrance. Guests were already approaching, bringing flowers and gifts, but Catherine was nowhere to be seen. The older folks started joking, saying that brides are supposed to be late. But hadn't she flitted away like a little bird from the nest? After Catherine had been gone for more than an hour, a light buzz of discontent began to spread among the crowd. At that moment, Eric understood everything. He just hoped until the last moment, didn't want to believe that Catherine could do this. But the facts spoke for themselves. After two hours, Eric asked everyone not to disperse and went home. The wedding dress hung on the hanger, and on the table was a note of apology explaining that she didn't want to live in the village anymore, to twist cow tails and smell manure. She wanted a rich life, and therefore she was going to Dean. But the main thing was, there was not a word about love. He would have understood her actions if Catherine had written that she loved Dean. But it turned out that she had fled for a rich life. Eric reached for the money that had been saved for the wedding. She had taken it all. Oh, Eric felt hurt. And people were waiting by the village council. How would he show up there now? The tables were already set at the club. But couldn't Catherine have said something about her decision in advance? They could have canceled the wedding, and he would have let her go in every direction. But now it turned out that she had humiliated him in front of the whole district and even took the money. How would he pay off the people now? Eric was on the edge. His eyes fell upon the rope lying under the bed. Why not? He could solve all his problems at once and most importantly, get rid of the unbearable pain in his chest. Emotional pain always torments the most. There's no medicine for it, and there's no painkiller either. Eric took out the rope and stood on a chair. At that moment, his mother ran into the room. Son, what are you doing? 
This fool isn't worth your life, she said in some strange voice, as if the words echoed in her head. Mom, you're dead, Eric was surprised. At that moment, thunder crashed outside, the storm was approaching. Eric looked toward the window, then turned his head to his mother, who had appeared out of nowhere after so many years. But there was no one in the doorway, only her portrait hanging on the wall next to the wardrobe. Eric got down from the chair. Well, what's going on? What was that just now, he thought. He had never believed in mysticism or ghosts, and yet he had seen his mother, who had long since passed away. Was it some kind of sign? Eric pondered what to do now. A jilted groom, that was how they would call him in the village. Then Eric remembered that a long time ago, he had stashed some money right behind his mother's portrait. He wanted to give Catherine a gift for New Year's. But they had quarreled back then, and he forgot about the money. Eric grabbed his mother's portrait and, still dressed in his wedding suit, headed for the train station. Since then, he hadn't been back to the village until he decided to stop by before that important deal. What was drawing him there all of a sudden? And then there were those girls, the homeless children who spoke Spanish, who were simply astonishing, to say the least. But what surprised everyone was not that the children could read the contract in Spanish. What amazed them all was that when they read it to the end and saw Eric's name, the children rushed to him, saying, Dad, Daddy, we finally found you. Dad, don't sign the contract. This man will cheat you. He kicked our mom out. He'll do the same to you. The whole thing was that this deal with the Spanish partners was something Eric had intercepted from Dean. He and his team had literally hunted for this deal for a long time, undercutting the price, worsening the conditions for their side, just to get the Spaniards to agree. Dean was a co-founder with the Spaniards, so his name also appeared in the contract. In short, this deal was a kind of revenge for Eric against his former best friend, who had stolen Catherine from him. Along with the letter that Eric's mother received, there was another message for Catherine, in which Dean wrote that she could come to him. Dean's mother passed the letter to Catherine, and well, you understand everything from there. Girls, wait. Who is your mom? Eric asked in surprise. Catherine, Catherine, the girls replied in unison. Well, why do you think that I'm your father? Well, it's all written here in her diary. One of the sisters pulled out a dirty, greasy notebook from her bosom. Of course, the important negotiations ceased in light of the circumstances. The contract was sent for verification. Eric took Catherine's diary in hand, secluded himself in his office, leaving his assistants to take care of the girls. That morning, he had simply asked his secretary to look after the children while he was signing the contract. He thought that after the negotiations, he would feed them and hand them over to social services, but now everything was different. Now he had to figure out whose children they really were. Catherine's diary began with the moment she arrived in Spain. Perhaps she had never really loved Eric. After all, she left him so easily and ran to Dean. Eric read the diary of his former fiancée, the wife who never was. In the beginning, there wasn't a word about him, not a drop of regret for leaving him right before the wedding. Not even a single memory of Eric. This, of course, hurt him deeply, even now, after so many years. Catherine described the happiness she felt in the luxurious, wealthy life abroad, how good she felt with Dean. Eric was mentioned only in the context of comparing her new sensations to her old life. He didn't immediately realize she was writing about him. Catherine didn't even refer to him by name, she only mentioned him as the ex. At first, Eric thought she was talking about some third person she had met after him. But the description of village life clarified everything. Yes, the ex was indeed him. Without a name, without a face, just an embodiment of negative emotions and memories. 
And finally, he and Dean began preparing for the wedding, and on the eve of it, Catherine shared the joyful news, she was pregnant. Dean took her to the doctor, and it turned out that the term of her pregnancy was much longer than the time she had been in Spain. Dean realized that the child was not his, and Catherine understood that too. The boomerang rule applied. Wealthy and ambitious Dean kicked Catherine out onto the street. He treated her the same way she had treated Eric, with the difference being that Eric had stayed in his homeland, at home, and it had been his personal decision to leave the village and start anew. But poor Catherine found herself in a foreign country, without knowing the language, without means of subsistence, and pregnant. Eric's heart tightened as he imagined what Catherine must have felt then. He probably still loved her after all these years. Love forgives everything. He realized that he no longer held any resentment toward her. He understood what truly set him apart from Dean. Eric would not have abandoned Catherine even if she had confessed the day before the wedding that she was pregnant by someone else. Even if it were by Dean himself. Judging by the entries in her diary, Catherine began to understand this as well. It was at that moment on its pages that Eric first acquired his true name. Eric would never have treated me this way, Catherine wrote. She regretted betraying such a sincere and honest person as Eric. Catherine cursed the day Dean's mother brought her the envelope with his message. More and more tender and warm words flowed from her about Eric. She genuinely regretted not discovering her pregnancy while she was still at home. Otherwise, she wouldn't have rushed to Spain. Eric read and cried. And he could only understand one thing. Why? Why didn't she call him or at least write? He would have taken her from Spain. He would have forgiven her everything, for he truly loved her. He still loves her, even though the girls said that their mom had died. Eric could not believe that Catherine was no more. There she was, alive on the pages of the diary, as if she were sitting before him in a chair, telling him about her problems. In reality, she was buried somewhere in a foreign land. Why? Why didn't she turn to him for help, but preferred to deal with it all herself? The diary also provided an answer to this question. Wandering the streets of the Spanish city, Catherine survived as best as she could and wherever she could, not really knowing Spanish. She slept with homeless people and fought with them for food. By that time, she had either lost her phone or it had been taken from her or stolen. She didn't write about this. Such mundane details were hardly covered in her diary. What troubled her more and more was a growing feeling of hatred toward Dean, and there were even more warm and tender words about him. In the last months of her pregnancy, she was noticed by nuns from some order of St. Louis. They decided to help Catherine and invited her to stay with them. Catherine thought she had found salvation, but as it turned out, she had entered hell. The nuns locked her up, as well as many other pregnant girls. They were taken out of solitary cells only to perform the dirtiest tasks in the monastery. Life there was no different from what she had experienced under the bridge with the homeless, except now she had to pray tirelessly at night and work during the day. If her prayers were not deemed diligent enough by the nuns, Catherine was punished by being reduced to bread and water. The nuns believed that this was sufficient for the child to be healthy. The girls had no access to paper or writing materials, and even if they found some scrap that resembled a pencil, they would be punished. By some miracle, Catherine managed to hide her diary and find time to write in it. Words cannot convey the horrors that befell the novice girls. But the scariest part was not this. One day, Catherine learned what happened to the children after birth. Eric's heart chilled with horror as he read these lines. One day, she met a girl who had recently, just like her, been pregnant. The girl was either from Mexico or Canada and understood English well, so they could communicate quietly. The nuns did not encourage friendships among the novices. 
wherever there are two, there is a conspiracy, the nuns would always say. Did you give birth? Catherine whispered. Do you have a girl or a boy? Thank God, a girl, the girl replied. But why does everyone want boys? Boys are easier here, the girl, whose name was Dolores, answered. They don't even show them to the mothers, they take them away somewhere immediately. Oh God, what do they do with them? They say different things. I don't know for sure, I won't spread rumors. Weeks passed, and Catherine successfully gave birth to twin girls. Surprisingly, she was not invited. She gave birth right in the cell. The nuns themselves assisted with the delivery. And the very next day, Catherine was sent back to work, just like everyone else. The nuns named the girls themselves. All the girls were called the same, Louise, in honor of the patron saint of this monastery. If two girls were born, as in Catherine's case, the second girl would be named Sarah. It was that simple. Catherine tried to protest, but suddenly thought that they would put her back on bread and water. And that would adversely affect her milk and, consequently, the children. The food in the monastery was already not great, and Catherine barely had enough milk for both of her daughters. After all, Louise and Sarah weren't so bad, she thought, they would be Mitty and Sarah. A couple of days later, Catherine met Dolores again. She had no face, she was all teary-eyed. Something had happened? Is something wrong with your daughter? Catherine whispered. Dolores could only nod. Tears choked her, and she could barely speak. Is she sick? Catherine asked, fearing more than anything that the children would get ill. She herself had been a sickly child. Any breeze or wet feet could turn into pneumonia or angina. And here, in the damp stone walls of this medieval, moldy monastery, even a healthy person could easily fall ill. No, they took her, Dolores replied. They took her forever. Don't you know that our girls are given to wealthy childless families? This way, the sisters supposedly help poor orphans. You mean my girls will be taken too? Catherine almost shouted. Of course, they will. Didn't you know? Dolores seemed surprised. Didn't they tell you? I knew in advance when I came to this monastery. Then why did you come here? Catherine was surprised. At least here I have a roof over my head and food. Is it too high a price for their piece of bread and a leaky roof? Catherine exclaimed. That's life, Dolores replied meekly. Catherine learned with horror that this was not the first child the nuns had taken from her. Are there really women in the world willing to breed like cattle for food and shelter? Catherine was in shock. What a future awaited her. She didn't even want to think about where all these girls with children got their subsequent children. Who could be the father of her future children if she submitted to this situation? Even in such a difficult period of her life, Catherine remembered Eric. On the pages of her diary, she wrote that she missed him and wished she could see her twins just once. Every time someone entered her cell, there was no habit of knocking. She feared that they had come to take the girls away. Dolores said that it was not guaranteed they would end up in the same family. No one here thought about that. Only if the wealthy truly wanted twins would they have a chance to grow up together. Catherine decided, come what may, to run away from this place. Her diary abruptly ended on the pages. There were no entries about how she managed to escape. Apparently, she had no time to document her actions. The next entry began with a word written in capital letters, Freedom. God, thank you. You probably exist, and my prayers to you were not in vain. I am free. And that monastery was far away. My girls are with me. All that now reminds me of that horror are the names of the children. 
but the children are not to blame. I can no longer fix that. Forgive me, my girls, Mindy and Sarah. That's how I will call you now, wrote Catherine. How I miss your father by my side. Oh, if only you knew what a wonderful man he is. It is at this point in the diary that Catherine mentions his full name and surname. She managed to settle in a small Spanish village as a housekeeper for an old Spaniard. Now, Catherine wrote almost nothing about her current life. She only described how good it was at home, in her homeland in America, often recalling her childhood, writing about what it was like, and remembering Eric. It seemed that Catherine wanted to leave her daughter's memories, memoirs, a legacy about their historical homeland. At first, Eric did not understand what this was all about. She could tell her children everything herself. Catherine returned to the pages of the diary less frequently. Now entries appeared once or twice a month. The gap between the last entries was almost half a year. It was then that the old Spaniard kicked Catherine off his farm. First of all, he wanted the girls to work for him instead of attending school. They were already five years old, and the old man believed they could work just fine. And since they were Americans, he had no use for them. His wife had died, and the old man decided to find a young mistress. For a long time, they wandered again. For a while, they even managed to attend school. The last entry in Catherine's diary was heartbreaking. It stated that she had children and needed help. This entry was addressed to the girls. My dear Mindy and Sarah, when you find this diary, I will most likely no longer be alive. Your mom loves you very much. Your mom cannot imagine how you will live without her, but that is life. Apparently, I am sick. I caught this illness, no one knows, the doctors shrug their shoulders, and I have no money for expensive doctors. It's a pity I could not provide you with the future you deserve. You are the best thing that ever happened to me in this life. Stick together, try to do everything you can to return to your homeland, my homeland, because your real father lives there. Then, Catherine mentions Eric's name and surname once more. Already weakening, in the last pages of the diary, she drew a map of how to get to that village from which she had escaped many years ago. Eric sat and cried. Almost feeling no guilt, he hated Dean, hated Catherine, and with his hatred, he masked his love for her. Like the coward he was, he simply preferred to run away to avoid being taunted as a jilted fiancé. All he had to do was find Catherine or Dean, go to Spain, and simply bring his family home. Perhaps our doctors could have cured Catherine, and she would be alive. After their mother's death, the girls continued to wander until they ended up at the Red Cross. From there, learning that their mother was American, the embassy sent Mindy and Sarah to America. And where do you think they ended up? Of course, in an orphanage. The girls never showed anyone Catherine's diary, keeping it as their most prized possession. The officials only managed to find out where Catherine was born, but it turned out that place was now empty. In its stead, the city authorities had built a landfill. There were no relatives left alive, and the girls went off to the orphanage. They remembered that place with disgust. It was better at the old Spaniard's farm than in that refuge. We won't describe the horrors of orphanage life. The girls wanted to find the village their mother had written about in her diary. No one bothered to tell them that the village no longer existed. Or maybe it was for the best. Otherwise, Eric would never have found them at that landfill, and perhaps they would have never met. The children didn't understand how to search for a person, and they thought their father still lived in that same village. Sarah ran away from the orphanage. No one really kept an eye on the kids, and using their mother's map, the girls easily found the village. Or rather, what was left of it. Now, there was a huge mountain of trash and scraps, which was periodically leveled out. 
the girls decided that this was the very place where their mom and dad were born. This is where they themselves should have been born. The dump, the garbage, the dirt, and the scraps quickly did their work, turning the girls into those very filthy creatures covered in dirt and stench. And then you already know the rest. On that very day, it seemed as though something beckoned Eric to his homeland. He too had no idea that the village no longer existed. Just a garbage dump. The night before, he dreamed of his mother. She often visited him in such crucial moments. Thanks to this dream, Eric decided to make a quick trip back home before finalizing the deal, just to stand at a distance and look at the village from the rooftops. It turned out that there was nothing left at all. Two small figures caught his attention. It turned out to be his daughters, of whom he had no knowledge. A document check confirmed that if he had signed that contract, blinded by a sense of revenge, he would have lost everything, his company, his business, and literally everything. The documents were sent to the prosecutor's office. Eric initiated the case and practically destroyed the greedy man, leaving him with nothing. Eric turned out to be a one-woman man. He couldn't love anyone else in those ten years. He wouldn't try any longer. Now he had a reason to live, his girls, his twins, his and Catherine's. Isn't that the greatest happiness in the world? When he saw the girls, Eric immediately noticed how much they resembled their mother. Under the layer of dirt, it wasn't apparent. Many suggested he take a DNA test to confirm that the girls were indeed his, but Eric sent such advisors away. First of all, he had Catherine's diary. In the diary, it was written in black and white, who is the father of the children? How could he blindly lie to his daughters? She wrote the diary for them, not for anyone else. And second, they were Catherine's children after all. What difference did it make who their father was? It meant nothing to Eric. Now their father would be him, once and for all, and no tests or anything else could change that, ever. Happiness, finally. After many long years, the children have finally found a family and everything they are entitled to by age and status. They have suffered enough and seen too much abroad. Now they can breathe easily and no longer flinch at every rustle at night. As they say, justice has apparently triumphed. Although everyone has their own understanding of justice, some might say that Catherine punished herself for her carelessness and thirst for a wealthy life, while others might blame Eric for his cowardice or perhaps Dean. The main thing is that the children are truly happy now.